Hi everybody, um, my name is Ken McMahon, I'm the author of PaintShop Pro X4 for Photographers, uh, which is published by Focal Press. Uh, thanks for attending this webinar. What I'm going to be talking about uh, is uh, basically is about HDR, which uh, many of you will already know stands for High Dynamic Range, uh, and specifically about the HDR Exposure Merge feature in PaintShop Pro X4. Uh, I'm going to spend uh, a little while at, at the beginning just to explain briefly what HDR is um, and um, how you can use it uh, to produce the kinds of things you can probably see on my screen now. I've got some examples here. I'll be talking about what HDR is, why we need HDR in the first place, uh, and some of the things that you can do while you're shooting uh, to make sure, well, to make sure of two things really. One is that uh, life's a little easier for you when you're actually producing your HDR images, and the second thing is that you get the best results possible. Uh, so what's HDR? Why do we need HDR? What, what's wrong with uh, an individual exposure? What HDR sets out to achieve is to overcome one of the limitations of, of modern camera sensors, and indeed um, before that film, which is that unlike our eyes, which uh, are, are used to dealing with um, quite large changes in brightness levels, if you go into a dark room and then go out into bright sunlight, your eye can cope very quickly and easily with those kinds of changes in brightness levels, but camera sensors aren't so good at doing that. In fact, camera sensors, um, if, if you want the technical side of it, are capable usually of, of recording around seven or eight stops of brightness in, in a scene. Now, whilst for most scenes, that's, that's usually more than adequate, or, or adequate enough at least, there are a lot of scenes where the brightness range uh, extends outside of that seven stop range, and there you have a problem, uh, because what happens is, the sensor can't record all of the brightness levels in the scene as before your camera. Uh, and it has to, well, you have to make a decision, I guess, with the exposure, or if you've got your camera set to automatic exposure, it will make that choice for you. Um, and the result is uh, one of two things. Either you lose detail in the highlights of the image, the highlights are blown and they, and they all go white, or you lose detail in the shadows, and all the shadows fill in and, and go a murky black color. So you can't get the entire tone of the range. Um, but if you use HDR, you can do that. So the way HDR works is it takes um, a series of exposures taken at different exposure settings in order to capture the entire tonal range and scene. Uh, and then software can, um, if you like, sandwich those exposures together uh, and use the tonal information in all of them in order to produce a single composite image which recalls the full tonal range that was in the scene. So that's basically what HDR is for. It enables you to take pictures in situations where, where you wouldn't be able to capture the complete tonal range with a single exposure. Um, so, so much for what HDR does. How do you go about making those exposures? What's the best way to do it? Uh, while I'm talking about these techniques that you can use while you're shooting, there's a, you, probably, you can probably see I've got a few examples up here that I created earlier. Um, some of these examples are the ones that I'll be using uh, during the webinar uh, now. So we've got a LichGate HDR example up at the top here. I've created three different versions of that um, using different presets in PaintShop Pro. And there are some other images uh, underneath, some of which uh, the boat one, for example, we'll be looking at producing. Um, some of the others we may not get onto, but uh, we'll see how much time we've got. So, obviously the first thing you need to do in order to create an HDR exposure is you've got to take the pictures. And what's the best way to go about that? A frequent question that's asked is, do I need a tripod uh, to produce HDR images? And the answer to that is no you don't, particularly if you're using PaintShop Pro X4, because um, that has tools which will enable you to use handheld shots to produce HDR images. The problem being, I talked about sandwiching images earlier on, if you're using more than one image to take a shot to create an HDR photo, and you've handheld the camera, then obviously the camera will have moved between exposures. Um, and ordinarily that's quite a bad thing, because if you're sandwiching images together, you can have a problem with uh, the, uh, the relevant parts of the image registering up properly, and you'll get a blurry result. But PaintShop Pro has tools which will enable you to also align images and overcome that problem. So hand-holding is no problem at all. Uh, obviously, if you've got a tripod and you can use it, uh, it will make life slightly easier for you and you might get slightly better results, but it's not absolutely essential. The other question, which I guess a lot of people will be wondering, is whether you need any kind of special equipment for, uh, 
taking HDR photos in terms of special uh, features on your camera or anything like that? And the answer again is it, pretty much no, straightforwardly. You can take HDR images with more or less any camera from the most basic point and shoot. There is one particular feature that you need, and that is that you have to be able to um, manipulate the exposure controls on the camera because you've got to have three bracketed, bracketed exposures. I'll come and talk about this in more detail when we actually get to producing HDR images. Um, but you really need a minimum of three exposures taken at different exposure settings in order to capture the full range of brightness levels in an image. Um, but even a point and shoot camera will let you do that. Most uh, even basic cheap point and shoots have something called exposure compensation, which will allow you to first of all take an image uh, the correct exposure as determined by the camera, and then take another couple of images, uh, both overexposed and underexposed, if you like. So um, if, if you've got a basic point and shoot and you're wondering whether it's suitable for HDR photography, just check to see whether it's got an exposure compensation button, uh, and that's all you need. Obviously, if you've got a more advanced camera, uh, you'll be able to do things with that which will make your life slightly easier. Um, if it's got manual exposure controls, you can manually bracket your exposures. Uh, or if it's got uh, some uh, SLRs and advanced compact cameras, ILC cameras, have auto bracketing, which will, if you hold the shutter release down and you've got them correctly set up, which will automatically take a sequence in quick succession of three, five, or in some cases even seven exposures, which will also bracket it. So you don't really have to worry about anything. You just have to set the camera to auto bracket, press the shutter release down, and the rest happens for you automatically. Um, so if you've got auto bracketing on your camera, it's so much the better. But all of these things are kind of bells and whistles, if you like, which can make your life a little bit easier. They're not absolutely essential. Um, at the very basic, all you need is a simple point and shoot camera, and you can shoot bracketed exposures for HDR. Um, so uh, that's pretty much all I want to say about shooting. Uh, look, we might as well get straight into it and kick off with our first example. What I'm going to show you is um, how to produce this Lichgate HDR um, uh, image that we see here. I've got three different examples of it. I'm going to produce one, which probably isn't going to look like any of these three. Um, so let's get started straight away. I've got um, a tray here called Lichgate HDR, which has got my three exposures in. Uh, I talked about bracketing before. Brack with um, a Sony NEX5N camera. If I click on one of these, you can see the EXIF data uh, down here on the info panel in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, and the Sony NEX5N is one of those cameras that I was talking about, which enables you to auto bracket, which is what I've done with these exposures. So I held the shutter release down. It took three exposures in quick succession. And looking at them, um, I would say this, this one on the left here is what you'd call the correctly exposed image. Uh, this image in the middle looks like it's around one stop underexposed. It's slightly darker than our first image here. And this one, which looks slightly lighter, uh, is round about one stop overexposed. In actual fact, for auto bracketing, the NEX5N, you can't set it to over and underexposed by one stop. It actually does, for some reason, best known to Sony, 0.7 of a stop. Um, it's often you'll see these, these um, bracketed exposures referred to in terms of something called EV which stands for exposure value, uh, and it equates to the same thing as a stop in exposure, if you like. So if we, again, if I click on this first image and we take a look at the EXIF data, um, and I scroll down just so we can see the exposure information, um, the f-stop number uh, for this exposure was f11, uh, and the aperture, sorry, the the shutter speed was 1 50th of a second. So the exposure for this image was 50th of a second at f11. And if we move along to this image here, uh, it's an 80th of a second, also at f11. Uh, and the third exposure is a 30th of a second at f11. So as I said, they're slightly under one stop apart in terms of exposure. And the other reason I wanted to show you these three images and, the, and their relative exposure um, ex exposures is that uh, as we can see from the active data down here, the aperture for these three exposures has remained constant, and it's the shutter speed that's changed. And I just wanted to point that out, because if you're um, creating your exposures manually, you might be wondering, well, if I'm going to create three exposures, should I alter the aperture or the shutter speed in order to create those different exposures? And the answer is it's usually always best to change the shutter speed, because if you change the aperture, you're at risk of um, 
altering the depth of field in the image. Some elements which might be in focus in one frame, if you open up the aperture to create an overexposed image, it could throw those elements out of focus. And then when you come to create your composite HDR image, it's going to cause problems for the software if it's got some elements that are in focus in some frames and out of focus in other frames. So as a general rule of thumb, uh, when you're creating your exposures for HDR, uh, change the shutter speed rather than the aperture and always keep the aperture fixed. Uh, so that's as much as I'm going to say about exposure and we'll, we'll dive straight into the HDR exposure merge feature. Um, in order to do that you need to select all three of, uh, of these uh, exposures. So I'm just going to shift click uh, to, to select all three of those thumbnails there in the manage workspace of Paintshop Pro X4 and then go to the file menu here uh, and come down to HDR and then from the sub menu select exposure merge there. Uh, and we'll just wait for that to pull up uh, the first step one panel uh, and to process those three images. And there they are. So this is the uh, the HDR exposure merge panel uh, and it says step one over here on the right hand side. And this is the merge phase of the process if you like. Um, and we've got some controls down here on the left hand side. Uh, and down the bottom here you can see your three images which we selected before we entered this uh, this screen in the Manage Workspace of PaintShop Pro. Uh, now, if we've got three bracketed images here, you don't necessarily have to use three. Um, you can use more than three if you want to, and, and later on I'll show you another example in which I've used five bracketed images. Um, it's not necessarily better to have more, uh, although obviously if the range of, of brightness levels in your scene is very wide, it could be useful to have more rather than fewer exposures to record it. Generally speaking, I find I get very good results from most scenes uh, with three bracketed exposures. But there are occasions when I've used five just to be on the safe side and you can get perfectly good results from five as well. Uh, if having chosen your three exposures down here you decide you want to add more, um, there's a plus button down here, but it's usually far easier if you get everything you need before you come into this stage. Uh, and if you decide having imported uh, several images, there's one or two that you don't like the look of and you decide you don't want them. If you just select them and then click the minus button here, that will take them out of the mix and just leave you with the others. Um, but so we're, we're going to stick with the three that we've got here. So I'm just going to explain some of these controls down the left hand side. Uh, the first one here is called Camera Response Curve Profile. And if I click on the pull down menu here, you can see we've got a number of different cam camera manufacturers which are listed. Now, as I said before, these uh, frames were shot with a Sony NEX5N. So I could select Sony from here, uh, and I'm sure that would give us very good results. Generally speaking, I don't bother with this. Um, I've tried it once or twice, um, and from a kind of cursory examination of the results, I, I haven't seen any improvement uh, on the results that I get just from using Auto Select. And because I, I quite often do HDR using different cameras, I just find it easier to, to leave on Auto Select. You might find you get different results, and I, obviously, uh, if you if you can recognise if your camera is listed here, the manufacturer of your camera is listed. Uh, I'd recommend you give it a try, uh, both with the also select option and with your particular camera manufacturer selected and see what kind of results you get. But as far as I'm concerned, uh, I'm quite happy going with also select, so I always leave it on that quite honestly. Um, next section down is the alignment section. Uh, I talked a little bit earlier on about whether you need a tripod or not. Uh, these shots were handheld, um, and probably, I don't know whether you can see if I cycle between them there, you can notice there's a tiny bit of movement. Uh, I'm amazed I held it that still actually, but there is nonetheless a tiny bit of movement between these frames. Uh, and unless we also align them, um, they're going to be out of registration when we come to produce the HDR image. I'll just quickly show you what will happen if you do that, actually, by clicking this process button at the, uh, at the bottom here. Uh, I don't know how well you can see that on your screens, but what I'm looking at looks like it's got a bit of camera shake going on or something like that, and that's because the images haven't been aligned and they're not in register with each other. You can see it most clearly down the bottom here where the gravel looks very blurry. Um, so that's what happens if you hand hold and don't align your images. If these were shot on a tripod, that wouldn't have been a problem. Uh, but I'm going to go back. Uh, and uh, just explain one other thing about alignment before I click this align button here, which will also align the images for us. Uh, there are two options you can have uh, for, for alignment. One is feature-based and one is edge-based. 
Um, basically, it's just uh, two different algorithms which perform the also alignment function, one of which uses detail around the edges of the image and tries to match that up, uh, and the other which uses features within the image. Uh, and I would guess uh, that this algorithm is slightly more complex and takes a little bit longer to get the result. But either of them, uh, I found, works well with most subjects. What I'd advise you to do is use one, and if you find it doesn't work terribly well, then use the other one. Uh, for now, I'm going to stick with edge-based. We'll give that one a try. Also, Crop, if you have this box checked and, checked, and I recommend you do, um, Obviously, if you align all three images, there are going to be parts around the edge where you've got image from some frames but nothing from others. And what all also crop does is it means up that edge and gives you a clean edge. So I'm going to uh, go straight ahead and press that alignment button. Uh, so we're using edge-based alignment for this, but as you can see, it's working pretty quickly on these images, which are um, 16 megapixel JPEGs from the camera. So they're, they're fairly large. Uh, 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 but PaintShop Pro deals with them fairly quickly, all the same. So our image is now aligned. Uh, and we're ready to go to the next stage. There's some custom editing tools down here um, with various brushes. Uh, and I'm going to explain those in the second example that I'm going to show you in the webinar. So I'm just going to ignore those for now. We don't need them then of no particular use with this particular image. And that will become apparent later on when I explain how we're going to use them and exactly what they're for. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to click this process button at the bottom, which will take us to the next stage of the HDR process. And that's step two, HDR adjustment. So our three images have now been combined. Uh, and we've got, uh, essentially, we've got one file here with all the tonal data from those three bracketed exposures in there already. Um, but we've still got some work to do because we can now decide or get PaintShop Pro to decide for us how that tonal information is going to be interpreted uh, and make some other adjustments to the image to get exactly the kind of look that we're looking for. Uh, and the first step to doing that is you can probably see on the left here we've got a number of presets we can choose from. In fact, there are none of those presets have been applied. And what you can see here in the preview window is, if you like, a sort of plain vanilla HDR, which in itself looks pretty good. I think it's got some nice tonal detail. Uh, it's all there. But um, so you could theoretically, I suppose, um, just go straight on from this to the next stage of the process. But the, uh, the, some of the presets are quite interesting to look at, uh, as are. Uh, and some of these controls are quite useful uh, for fine-tuning, if you like, what we've got here. Uh, and you can produce some radically different results using them as well. So let's take a look at some of these presets. Uh, default 1. Um, I'm not sure why this is default 1, actually, because it's one of the most um, radical of all the presets. As you can see, it gives a very saturated, quite uh, contrasty, result. Uh, may not be to everybody's liking. You see a lot of this kind of HDR stuff on the web, uh, so some people clearly do like it. Um, personally, it's, it's not uh, to my preference, but uh, there you go. There it is. It's preset one. Default two gives a much more natural look, as you can see. You know, if anything, it's slightly desaturated, actually. Um, uh, again, a lot, of these, a lot of these presets are down to personal preference. Don't worry too much if you try them all out and you think, well, I don't really like any of those because, as I said before, there are some more controls which we can use to fine-tune the process after you've chosen the preset. Uh, default three, uh, again, uh, well, a very high contrast look here. I don't particularly like this because it's lost a lot of the detail uh, that are in these gravestones, which is one of the things um, that I think HDR is useful in being able to sort of highlight uh, and draw attention to. Um, so that one's a bit too contrasty for my liking. But, there, I, you know, there are some subjects it would probably work quite well for. Um, I don't think this is one of them. Let's have a look at default four. Again, uh, quite a highly saturated uh, look, this. Um, but the, 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 if you're observant, you'll have noticed the difference between this and default one, which we looked at earlier on. Whereas with that one was very, a very contrasty image. This has less contrast in it uh, and looks slightly softer. In fact, some of the colors appear to be glowing a little bit. Um, and I'll show you how you can get that effect using some of the sliders uh, in just a moment. Uh, so let's take a look at the last two presets. This is default four. I actually like this one a lot um, because it's very understated and very subtle, and it kind of puts me in mind a little bit of um, Victorian uh, black and white images that have been hand colored. I think it has that kind of look about it, and then, you know, in many ways, it's a perfect fit for this subject, which is uh, a medieval church lich gate. So uh, that's default four. Uh, sorry, default five, and the final one, default six. Uh, is a, a, a pure monochrome black and white um, HDR 
preset. Um, I, I, I think black and white HDR is something that's been kind of overlooked a bit in the HDR scene up to now, uh, but I think it works really well. I don't like this particular preset that much. I like the fact it's black and white, but it's too contrasty. Again, lost a lot of the detail and gravestones up here, which I'm not particularly keen on, but that's something that you can fix um, by tweaking the adjustment sliders later on. So then the six default presets. Uh, I'm going to look at some of these controls underneath, uh, and then when I've explained how they work and what they do, we'll come back up and take a look at some other features of the presets uh, in just a little while. Uh, I think probably the best thing to do as far as these sliders are concerned is um, maybe go back to the original uh, image that we had before we applied any of those presets. Uh, and to do that, you can click this reset button, which is at the bottom of, of these individual controls. So I'm just going to click that, and that will take us right back to where we started before we applied any of the presets. Uh, so let's just scroll back up to the top of these controls here. Uh, and you'll see the first one that we've got here is a, is a temperature slider, uh, which is referring to color temperature. Uh, something that anybody who's processed raw images before will be familiar with. What this slider does is it allows you to warm up or cool down the tones in the image in the same way um, as setting the white balance control on your camera. Uh, it, it allows you to do that subsequently, really. Uh, and the way that that works is if you drag the sliders to the right, the image gets warmer, like that. And if you drag the sliders to the left, the image gets cooler, like that. Uh, and if you leave the slider where it was to begin with, um, you, you, know, you, you get the result as recorded by the white balance setting on your camera when you shot the image. I actually quite like, uh, I think it suits this image to have it warmed up a bit. It it's, um, gives it a kind of honey-colored honey glow, which I think suits the subject quite well. So uh, I'm going to leave that round about there. Uh, the next few are, uh, will be fairly self-explanatory to people who are used to, to those of you who are used to making your own adjustments either in PaintShop Pro uh, or in Camera Raw Lab or in any of the proprietary uh, Camera Raw applications for processing raw images. Um, contrast adjusts the contrast. So if we drag it to the right, our image gets more contrasty. And if we drag it to the left, it gets less contrasty. So that's fairly um, straightforward. We'll leave it roughly in the middle where it was before. Um, then we've got highlights, midtones, and shadow sliders, uh, which control the tonal reproduction in each of those tonal ranges. So with the highlights, if you drag it to the right, it makes the highlights brighter. And if you drag it to the left, it makes the highlights uh, a little bit darker. It remaps those highlights to, to lower pixel values. One of the things I guess it's worth mentioning with these sliders is that if you if you're, if you're making these adjustments, say, in PaintShop Pro on a, on a single frame image, uh, you've got very little tonal detail in there to play with. Um, if it's a 16-bit image, you'll have more. But even so, uh, if it's a single shot and you've made it as a single exposure, there's a limit to what you can do with highlights, midtones, and shadow sliders. But don't forget, we're dealing with an HDR image here, uh, so there's a lot more tonal information in there to begin with. Um, so you have a bit more scope with these contrast lights, sorry, with these highlights, midtones, and shadow sliders. And you'll have noticed that even if I drag this highlight slider up, we've lost a little bit of highlight in some of these outside cottage here. But generally speaking, there's you know there's not too much clipping of the highlights going on in here. Uh, even so, I'm going to drag that back down to more or less where we started with uh, midtones. Same thing happening. You can brighten the midtones or darken the midtones. Um, because this is quite a um, if you like an average image in, term of, in terms of the tonal distribution, there's not really a lot to be gained by adjusting these sliders for this particular image. But there are circumstances in which you'll find you can improve the result by dragging these sliders. Finally, shadow sliders, I can make the shadows darker or I can make them brighter. Okay, so there are, there are some examples, for, exa for instance, where you might find that darkening the shadows a little bit just gives the image a little bit more depth. And in fact, if I take that down to about minus eight or nine, that doesn't look too bad. We've still got plenty of detail in here, but it gives it a little bit more contrast and punch, if you like. Uh, so let's leave it at that. So that's highlights, midtones, and shadows. And then we've got a vibrancy slider here. Um, for anybody who doesn't know the difference between vibrancy and saturation, 
Uh, whereas the saturation slider, you can boost the saturation in an image and it will continue to add saturation to the three color channels, even when those color channels become oversaturated and clipped. Vibrancy is a bit more of a subtle control, so if I, if I'll just boost it up here. Well, I say subtle, obviously, that's, uh, if, you, if you, over, you can overdo it with vibrancy in the same way that you can overdo it with saturation. But even though we've added a lot more color into that image, none of the color channels will be clipped. Um, so you, you won't get that kind of blockiness of color that you often get with the saturation slider. Uh, and likewise, if you reduce that down, it will take a lot of the saturation out. And that's how you get that kind of, uh, on our, I think it was preset uh, four, default four, was it the preset? No, it was default five, the preset that had the kind of hand-colored Victorian look. That's just a question of reducing the vibrancy. Um, so, uh, in fact, I'll show you now. I'll, I'll leave that for later. We'll come back and look at that preset five, uh, and we'll make some adjustments to it in a little while. Uh, so that's basically those tonal controls, uh, the contrast highlights, midtones, and shadows, and then finally the vibrancy slider. Uh, I'll just put that more or less back to where it was, uh, just so we get a fairly natural looking result here. Uh, and that brings us to the kind of, uh, well, to the final panel, really, in, in the set of adjustments that you get in this second phase of, of um, HDR exposure merge. Uh, and these, um, well, there are two sets of adjustments, really, uh, as you can see from the pull-down menu here. The first one is labeled natural detail, and the second one is labeled creative detail. I'm going to show you the natural detail ones first. Um, they're slightly more complicated than the, create, than the uh, creative detail ones in that there are three sliders, whereas creative detail, as we see in a minute, only has two. Uh, but they're still fairly straightforward to use. Okay? There's a local highlights, a local midtones, and a local shadows slider. Um, now, they're similarly named to the, uh, to the sliders above. You remember we had a, hi a highlights, midtones, and a shadow slider. This is local highlights, local midtones, and local shadows uh, that we've got on the sliders here. Despite the fact that they're similarly named, they actually do something very different. They, I'll show you by, by adjusting the first one, actually, and you can see what's going on here. Like I'll, in fact, I'll put that to the maximum, which is 100. Uh, I'll drag it up to the minimum, uh, which is uh, minus 100. Okay, and I'll do the same thing with the midtones and the shadows, just so you can see what this is doing. Um, okay, and while I'm doing that, I'll explain what these sliders do and how it varies from the tonal controls that we looked at earlier. Whereas before we were changing uh, the, 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 the tonal range, we were taking the highlights uh, and making them either brighter or darker, and the same with the mid or shadows. This isn't actually changing the brightness or the darkness of those pixels. What it's doing is it's changing the local contrast. Um, it's evaluating uh, the difference between adjacent pixels and either boosting or reducing the contrast between those adjacent pixels. Uh, individually in the highlights, midtones, and shadows region of the image, which is why, to, let's go back and take the highlights as an example again, if I drag this highlight slider up, uh, what you can see what happens to the highlights is they become harder looking, uh, and if I see them is they become kind of softer looking. Um, th these controls have a share a lot in common with um, Unsharp Mask, if you've used that in PaintShop Pro, because Unsharp Mask works in a similar way. In fact, there was a technique years ago where the Unsharp Mask controls could be used with a very high radius setting and a very low strength setting to kind of make an image pop. And what that was doing was enhancing the local contrast. And these sliders do exactly the same thing. They're enhancing contrast between adjacent pixels in those three tonal regions. So um, that's all of those controls there. Uh, and basically, all of these presets here, from default uh, one through to default six, uh, simply apply uh, predefined settings using these sliders. So if we go to the default five setting, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back because I didn't explain, I forgot to explain one thing, which is the uh, the creative detail. So we'll come on to the presets again in a second. Let's just go back to, um, well, let's select uh, default three as the starting point, no, default two, because that's much more natural looking. And I'll just briefly explain how creative detail works. This does a similar thing uh, to what happens with natural detail is that it enhances local contrast, but it does it in a slightly different way. Uh, there are two sliders, a strength slider uh, and a blocks slider. Okay? Now the strength slider controls, if you like, the strength of it, for want of a better word. Uh, it either applies a lot of uh, contrast enhancement or 
or a little depending on how fast we'd like to drag the slider. So you can see if I drag this all the way up to 100, our, our, our uh, image looks very hard and uh, contrasty. And if we drag it right down to the bottom, it looks quite soft. Okay. Uh, the blocks, technically speaking, what this is doing is it's defining the size of the blocks um, which are used to make the comparison uh, of contrast. So if we set it to um, let's set it to something arbitrary, 16. Technically what's happening is PaintShop Pro is comparing 16 by 16 pixel blocks and it's comparing the contrast between them. Uh, and if we drag it down to 8, it's comparing 8 by 8 pixel blocks. I don't know that necessarily knowing how it works or what it's doing helps you any. Uh, I find it much easier just to drag the sliders and see whether I like what kind of result I get. And generally speaking, I find that if you keep the block size small and the strength somewhere uh, in the bottom, in the lower left-hand side of this slider, if you like, um, you get the best results because once you go past 50%, things start to look very harsh. If that's the look you're after, uh, then that's absolutely fine. Uh, but for me, it looks a little bit unnatural and a bit kind of, um, well, a bit spooky looking, which again, uh, for this particular subject, might be appropriate, but uh, and it might be what you're looking for. Um, but generally speaking, it's not something that does it for me. So I tend to like, go for a low block size um, and small amount of strength. Uh, you know, usually around about the 25 mark or so. So that's creative detail. One other thing that I, I need to tell you about this is that um, these aren't um, cumulative controls. So you can't, for example, apply some natural detail and think, well, I like that. I'll now I'll apply a, a bit of creative detail. It's an either or thing. Uh, you can either have natural detail or you can have creative detail. And you do it one way or the other. As, you, as you'll notice, if I switch from natural detail to creative detail, we get a, a, a slightly different result. It changes. So you need to decide at the outset, am I going to approach this the natural detail way or the creative detail way? Um, generally speaking, you might already have guessed, I prefer the natural detail way. It's called that because it gives more natural results. But if you're looking for a bit more stylized result, then creative detail might be the way that you want to go. Uh, so that's natural detail, creative detail. Both of them do the same thing, uh, which is apply local contrast enhancements uh, in slightly different ways to give slightly different results. Um, okay, so now we'll go back to our uh, presets uh, and we'll do what I was uh, preemptively kind of doing about five minutes ago, which is um, I was explaining that these presets basically are exactly what I've said, they're presets. They're just uh, somebody has gone through uh, and found a look, somebody presumably works for Corel, found a look that they like, uh, which in the case of default five is this desaturated uh, sort of oldie worldy print look. Uh, and then some, well, that's quite nice. I'll create a preset from that. Um, so all of those preset details are here in the sliders, and you can alter them if you want to tweak this slightly. So for me, I quite like this. I quite like the way it works. But it's safe, let's say, for example, you love it, but you think it could do with just a little bit more color. I think it's a bit over the top in terms of desaturation. So you can just scroll down to the vibrancy control here and add a bit more of that color back in. It was on minus 67, so we could take it up to minus 29, for example. So there's less color in this image than there was in the natural scene. Uh, and there was in our bracket exposures, but uh, it's nonetheless a desaturated look. We've got some lovely kind of browns and greens in, the, in these gravestones here, which, which are brought out quite nicely. Uh, and you can do the same with any of the other controls, obviously. Now, once you've done that, you might think, well, that's a great look. I much prefer that to default five, and I'd like to be able to apply it at the click of a thumbnail uh, rather than have to twiddle with the controls every time I've got a new image that I want to process. Um, and you probably have guessed that, uh, that um, HDR exposure merge allows you to save your own preset. So having created this preset or any other preset, if we click on the disk icon here, uh, we can uh, type in the preset name. So we could call this, um, let's call it um, hand colored look. And I'm going to spell it the English way. Uh, and click OK. Uh, and now it's saved our preset down here and we've got hand colored look. And you'll notice I've got a couple of other presets here which I created myself previously uh, and called Chem Preset 1 and Chem Preset 2. So if I wanted to quickly switch to those to see how they look. Uh, 
and then we can go back to our hand colored look. So once you've you know you've you've got things working the way that you want and and you like the look of that, it's uh, it's a fairly straightforward process just to create the preset and then you can apply it. These are saved automatically. So once you've quit from Paint Shop Pro, they'll still be there when you come back, and you can apply those presets just by clicking the thumbnail, uh, and that's all there is to it really. Um, one other thing I quickly say at this stage is that on a general point, what works for some subjects doesn't necessarily work for others. And one of the things I found with, with my experiments with HDR is that um, sometimes you'll apply a preset like this to a scene and you'll think, wow, that's fantastic, it works really well. Uh, when you apply it to something else, it doesn't have quite the same effect. HDR is quite a subjective thing. Um, so what works well with one image won't necessarily work well with another image. But having said that, if you've got a preset like this which works quite well with landscape shots, let's say for example, the chances are it will work well with your other landscape shots. So kind of in a genre-specific way, presets can work very well. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is just don't expect a preset that works well with one image to work well with everything. It can, uh, the results can sometimes be a little bit surprising. Um, okay, so let's assume that we've started off with a preset, we've done a little bit of tweaking, we like the results, so we've, we've saved our preset as, as I did just now, uh, and that's pretty much as far as we want to go with this image, so what's, what's the next stage in the process? Uh, well, you'll have noticed down here at the bottom we've got a Create HDR File button here. Um, now, when I, the, what, my first time of using uh, HDR Exposure Merge, I kind of assumed that by pressing this button that would cre cre create my HDR image and that would be the end of the process. Um, an easy mistake to make, but uh, it, it is a mistake. What Create HDR File does is it saves this file as a 32-bit HDR file, image file. That's not generally speaking what you'll want. What you'll want to do is um, create either a PSP image file uh, from what we've got here, uh, which will be a 16-bit image, or you might want to save it as a JPEG. Either way, you won't get there by creating an HDR file. What that button does is, is it saves a special 32-bit file, which you can then be, bring back in uh, to HDR Exposure Merge and further experiment with. Or indeed, if, you, if, you, if you're familiar with other HDR applications, uh, one off the top of my head that I don't use much, but I know is very popular, is Photomatix. Um, or any other application that's compatible with 32-bit HDR files, you could then import that file into one of those applications and work on it further. You could also import it back into um, PaintShop Pro, into HDR Exposure Merge. So if you've got a certain way with something, but you decided that you wanted to do some more work on it later on, you could create an HDR file, and then you have to open it from the file menu in uh, PaintShop Pro, and it will pull it straight into HDR. Um, it well, one reason you might want to do that is you might think, well, I like the way this looks, but I'd like to save a file uh, with this preset, and I'd like to try some other presets as well. Uh, and if you've got an HDR file, you can pull it in and apply several different presets to it, instead of having to go right back to the start of the process with your bracketed images uh, and begin from step one all over again. So that's what the HDR file button's for. Um, it, I don't use it that often, uh, and you probably, you may well find that you don't need to use it either. Uh, in which case, the next stage of the process is to click the process button down the bottom here, uh, which will apply those changes to this image, uh, and when it's finished processing, you'll see what will happen. Um, this will take a little while because a 32-bit HDR file is quite a large file. There's a lot of data in there, uh, but in actual fact, we're there already. So uh, as you can see, it's opened it up in, in something called Step 3 Fine Tune, uh, which in fact is the Smart Photo Fix pane of PaintShop Pro. Uh, and that gives you the opportunity to apply some other changes here to it. Um, my view on this is... I've already had plenty of opportunities to make all the changes I want, uh, so it's unlikely that you're going to want to make changes to brightness, shadows, highlights, saturation, whatever. Uh, but if you do, that option is there, so that's absolutely fine. Generally speaking, where I go from here uh, is there's one of two routes. If you click the Edit button, it will open this image in PaintShop Pro uh, in the Edit Workspace, and then you can continue to do some more work on it then. So if you wanted to uh, make some further adjustments or uh, put a frame on it or do something like that, you could do that in PaintShop Pro. Uh, more often than not, I just want to create an image at this stage, so I click the Save and Close button. Okay, uh, and I'm going to call this one, uh, let's call it Webinar uh, Litchgate. A lich gate, for anyone who doesn't know, is um, it's a church gate with a roof on it, uh, which is something I, I 
vaguely was a woman, but I had to look up on Wikipedia all the same. Uh, okay, so let's call it uh, Women Are Litchgate JPG, and we'll save it in this Litchgate HDR folder here, uh, and click Save. You get a quick warning. Um, basically, all this says is uh, because of the requirements of the specified file format, the save file will have a bit depth of 24. What it's telling you is you've got a 32-bit HDR file here. You're saving it as a JPEG, which is an 8-bit file format. So uh, it, it basically you're downsampling the bit depth, which is absolutely fine. So we'll just click yes on that. Um, and then if I go to my Litchgate HDR folder and scroll down to the bottom here, we'll see webinar Litchgate JPEG. And if I go to the preview over this, uh, we can take a look at that and, that and there's our image. So that's it basically. If you want to create uh, a basic three frame um, HDR image using HDR Exposure Merging Patriot Pro, uh, that's how it works. Uh, and it's a fairly straightforward process. Uh, you can handhold the image, you can handhold the camera when you shoot your images, uh, and that's the kind of result that you can get um, depending on which of those presets you've applied and how you set the controls. I'm going to quickly move on uh, and show you a second example, which is a little more involved with this than this one, uh, but it demonstrates something that frequently happens when you uh, shoot HDR images, uh, and one of the, brilliant, in my view, brilliant ways that HDR exposure merge enables you to overcome this specific but quite common problem. Um, so I'm going to head back into the thumbnail view, uh, and we're going to go to uh, this uh, tray here, which is called River HDR. And you'll see this time I've got five exposures. Uh, so this is a five-frame exposure that I've done. Uh, I think I shot this one with an Olympus camera, uh, and I manually adjusted the exposure in this. So if, again, if, I'll quickly show you the uh, EXIF data. It's taken with Olympus EPM1. The exposure time for this frame is a 20th of a second. These are arranged here in order of brightness, if you like. So this is the most overexposed and this is the most underexposed. So we've got a 20th of a second here. At, uh, down here, you can see that they're all taken at f5.6. Uh, so I shot this frame at a 20th of a second. The next one at a 40th of a second, one stop less. The next one at an 80th of a second, one stop less. Uh, a 200th of a second, little more than uh, one stop less and a 500 of a second, again, a little more than one stop less, but broadly speaking, these images are all one stop apart. So we've got five frames, one stop apart. These were shot on a tripod, incidentally. I didn't hand hold them this time, but uh, we're going to have a different kind of a problem to the alignment uh, issue that we had with the other images. So I'm going to shift select all of those the way that I did before. Go to the file menu, uh, HDR, exposure merge, and that will import those five images into uh, our step one panel. And there we are. I'll just select the middle one because you can get a slightly better idea of what's going on here. Uh, again, this is a great subject for HDR uh, because it's got a very wide range of tones which I couldn't capture with a single exposure. If I had made a single exposure, it would have been this one. But as you can see, the highlights at the top of the river here are blown out. Uh, and I had to go two stops underexposed to get some nice highlight detail here. But then I'd lost all the nice detail down in the river bank uh, in the bottom right here, uh, and in this shallow water, there's some lovely browns going on there, and I've lost all that detail. So a single exposure isn't going to do it, but it's perfect for HDR. Okay. As I explained before, uh, don't need to align this one because it was taken on the tripod. And if I quickly whisk through these, you'll see uh, that the edges of the image uh, remain pretty constant, so no need to align. But if I click the process button, and we go to uh, the next frame, which is our composite HDR image again, um, you'll notice that we've nonetheless we've got a bit of a problem with this. Uh, and our problem is that this boat on the left here and this boat on the right here look very blurry. Uh, why do they look blurry if I have the camera on the tripod? Uh, the answer is because they're on the water and the water moves and the boat's moved as well. Um, I think I was a bit lucky with this subject actually because this boat is low tide and this boat happens to be sitting on the bed of the river which is the reason it hasn't moved um, but the tide is high enough to float these two boats and they bobbled around uh, between me making my five exposures even though there was probably only a couple of seconds between exposures uh, now what are we going to do about that uh, also, there's a bit of movement here, you might notice, for some reason this boy has pro is probably been floating on the water in this old wreck of a kind of dinghy here, uh, so that's going to be a problem for us as well. I'm going to click the back button here uh, to go back to step one, uh, 
uh, where we started out beforehand. Uh, and this is where these custom editing tools come in, these auto brushes. Okay? These allow you to brush in and brush out detail that you don't want to be included in the merge process. So if I select the brush out button here, uh, and you can see my brush tool now. And I can, I could, uh, let's, you know, we're on the brightest exposure here. So let's, let's suppose I just paint over this boat with this tool. Okay. Uh, now what that will do is, what I'm saying is to PaintShop Pro, don't use detail from this image uh, in the composite exposure. Okay. Now if I did things that way, that would be fine if there was only movement on one of the images. But in actual fact, there's movement on all of them. This boat is in a different place on every single one of these five images. Uh, so what PaintShop Pro does is gives me a better way of dealing with that problem, actually. I'm just going to uh, clear uh, that brushwork that I'm just putting down. I'm going to go to the middle image because it's the one I can see most clearly what I'm doing. There. And this time, I'm going to select Brush In. Okay, and I'm going to do exactly the same thing. This time, it will color in green rather than red. Okay, and I'm going to brush the whole of that boat in. like that. Okay, now what that's doing is similar but different to what I did before. Okay, it's saying to PaintShop Pro, uh, this boat here, this, this area of this image, that's what I want to use. I don't want to use that area in any of the other images. I just want to use this one. Uh, okay, and if I get, in fact go to any of the other images, you'll see it's automatically brushed out that detail on all of the other images for me. So it saves me the bother of having to do that work over and over again on every single image apart from this one. By brushing it in here, it brushes it out everywhere else. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, I've still got my brush in selected I think, just to make sure I'll click on it there. The other thing is you can adjust the brush size here. Our brush size currently is 126, let's make it a little bit bigger and we'll get this job done a little more quickly. Uh, and the other thing that may slightly be concerning you is I'm not being particularly accurate with my brushwork here. And the reason for that is you don't have to. Uh, in fact, in some ways, it's better if you're a little bit sloppy uh, and if you go over the edges like I'm doing here. Uh, because remember, this boat is moving around. Even though it's in this position on this frame, it's likely to be in a different position on another frame. And we need to brush out those areas on those other frames as well as brushing them in here. I'm just going to do this little uh, boy or whatever it is here as well. Now if I go to the other frames just to check, so you can see the boat's moved quite a long way to the right here and I haven't quite got all of it, so I'm going to go back to my frame here uh, and add in a bit more brushwork on the right hand side here just to make sure I've got everything. So if I then check on, uh, I'm still missing a tiny bit of the rail here, so I'll just put a wee bit, another blob on there. Uh, now that one's looking okay. That one's looking pretty good. That one's looking pretty good, and that one's looking pretty good. Obviously, with this, it's, uh, there's a little bit of trial and error involved. You need to do it, see what kind of result you get. If you've still got problems, you can always come back to this screen. Uh, your brushwork will still be there, uh, and you can edit, edit it, add to it if you need to, take away from it if you need to. The only other thing I mentioned here is you might be thinking, worrying a bit, and thinking, well, if you're brushing these bits of the image out. Um, they're not HDR, strictly speaking, because we've only got detail from one frame in those parts of the image. And the answer is that, that that's true, but it doesn't really matter because um, we're not really too concerned about HDR where these boats are. Uh, the exposure information to render them very well. What we need the extra information from the, from the other frames for is these highlight details here, which are blown out, uh, which we'll get from these underexposed frames. Uh, and some of the detail in the water here and in the foreground of the riverbank here, which we'll get from the overexposed frames. So, providing we're not brushing out, you know, the majority of the detail in all of the frames, it's not going to affect our, our HDR result too badly. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm happy with that. It's taking me, um, you know, just a few seconds to do that brushwork uh, and to deal with those problem areas. Let's click process and see what kind of result we get. It, surprisingly, it doesn't take that much longer to process the result, even though we put that brushwork in and removed some of the detail. What PaintShop Pro has had to do is mask it out so that it's not included in the final HDR composite. Uh, and there's our result. Uh, and I think you'll agree, uh, it's a pretty good one. Uh, I can't see. We've still got over here, uh, you'll notice it's still a bit blurry. Obviously, I've missed 
uh, there's a boat behind this boat, uh, which I haven't masked out. So ordinarily, uh, I'm not going to do it now because we're running a bit short of time, but ordinarily what I do is I would hit the back button here. I'm going to do it. I think we probably better I'm going to do that. Uh, and I will then, I've got the right frame, I've got the right brush. Let's just brush that in. I can't remember whether these boys were causing us a problem, but just to be on the safe side, I mean, they're on the water. I'm going to assume they're bobbing around, so I'm going to brush those out as well. Uh, okay, and I'm going to go with that and click process again. Uh, and hopefully that will give us a perfect result. And once we've done that, I'm going to do something slightly different with this image, whereas before I saved the last one to a JPEG file, uh, with this one, uh, let's first of all select a preset. Uh, let's go, let's try to, you know, uh, I, I kind of, I was a bit unkind to default one uh, earlier on, but having applied it to this image, I actually think it works pretty well. Uh, I mean, it's the, the color is very, very saturated. Maybe I'll reduce the color a tiny bit. Uh, the vibrancy is at 93%. Let's so take that down. Uh, to, to f right about 46, I think that's a, that's a, a, a really uh, really nice result. So I'm going to go with that. So I'm going to click process, uh, and as before, that will open up this image in the fine tune panel, which gives us the smart photo fix options. I'm not going to bother with those, but this time instead of clicking save and close, uh, I'm going to click edit, and that will open it up in PaintShop Pro. Okay. And what we'll get is a 16-bit image in PaintShop Pro. So if you wanted to make some further tonal adjustments to this or you wanted to do anything to it, you've got a 16-bit file to play with. There's plenty of headroom there for making further adjustments. Or you could just decide to save it. Uh, and uh, we'll go File, Save As. We'll save this one as a PSP image file, which will uh, retain our 16-bit data. Uh, and I'll call it... Uh, River Webinar HDR PSP image and we will save it. Uh, I think I've got a River HDR folder somewhere here. So we'll save it into there as a PSP image file. This time we don't get the warning because although technically, well, we're not downsampling because we're already into a 16-bit image here now that we've got it in PaintShop Pro. So that's it. That's saved it. Um, one other thing I just quickly want to explain, uh, so basically we're back in PaintShop Pro, there's our image, I'm just going to go back into the Manage Workspace. Um, if you now decided you wanted to redo this uh, or do another HDR example using, a, using different images, uh, let's go to File, HDR, Exposure Merges Grayed Out. Um, this flummoxed me for a while, for the, for the first time that it happened, uh, and I couldn't work out why can't I do an exposure merge with these images. I've, I've done it before, and it should work perfectly well. And the reason is, uh, if you go into, uh, if you choose to get, basically edit the image, the HDR image, in the final step of fine tune by clicking uh, Edit, the Edit button here. PaintShop Pro doesn't close the HDR exposure merge window. It's still open with your results still in here. Now, there are advantages and disadvantages to that. One of the advantages is uh, you can now continue to work on this. So if having got it into PaintShop Pro, you decided you wanted to try a different preset or you wanted to change something else about it, it's still there and you can do that. The disadvantage, obviously, is if you don't realize this is happening, you might wonder why your HDR merge exposure merge isn't working anymore. And the reason is this is still open. So what you have to do is simply close that. Uh, go back, I'll just maximize that window again, and then you'll find, let's just uh, shift select all our images again, that uh, your HDR exposure merge option is, is available once again. Okay, so two examples uh, which pretty much cover the complete gamut of, of controls and things you can do with HDR exposure merge in uh, Corel Paint Shop Pro. Um, I think it's a great feature. It's a big improvement on the um, HDR photo merge feature of Paint Shop Pro X3. So if there are any um, Paint Shop Pro I think it's PaintShop Pro Photo X3 that is the correct title. Users out there who are wondering whether to upgrade. I, I think that the HDR exposure merge feature in PaintShop Pro X4 is one of the, um, you know, it's one of the features that really makes an upgrade worthwhile. So, and hopefully if what you've seen here today has convinced you, you'll feel the same way. But, you know, I think it's a really great feature and it can produce some great results. And uh, 
I, you know, I hope that uh, I've inspired you today to go away and make some HDR images of your own. It's, um, it's really worth doing. It's something that I've, I've gained a lot of pleasure from, for sure. Um, we haven't got time. I was going to show you another example, which is how to create um, an HDR exposure merge image from a single image created from a raw file. You don't actually need to have bracketed exposures, believe it or not, to create an, ex uh, an HDR image. Um, but is. Um, there are details of how to do that on my website, which is www.gopaintshoppro.co.uk, uh, which is here. So, uh, and in fact, this is the example I'm talking about, H HDR exposure was using this uh, beach shot here. So if you've got lots of, I and mean, if, if you happen to shoot raw, and you're thinking, well, I'd love to try HDR exposure merge, but I, I haven't been taking bracketed exposures, so that's not an option for me. Not the case. Um, as long as you've got raw images, you can create uh, as it were, three exposures from a raw file and do it that way. Uh, and the latest tutorial on gopaintshoppro.co.uk shows you how to do exactly that. Uh, so I'd recommend you go along there and take a look. And um, yeah, hopefully uh, that will be of uh, some use and benefit to you. Uh, that's about all I've got to say. I'd just like to say thank you very much for, for joining me for the webinar. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. It's been a great experience and uh, hopefully we can do it again sometime.